That day of the tornado on June 23rd of 67, uh, my father and I, we were out by our barn and uh, these storm clouds were starting to swirl right above our place. And uh, so what eventually ended up being tornadoes actually started forming about 12, 15 miles south of Garden. Dad just said, uh, you know, this doesn't look good. Uh, and they said they believed there was pup tornadoes, several that came through. I don't know that we knew it was a tornado. It was a, we could tell it was a storm. We never saw the the tornado itself, but you could just see the storm was there was something going on that was different, you know. Once they got up to about the Garden City area, it seemed to kind of just all collaborate. And we 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 knew Garden was in trouble. I mean, my sister and I had paper routes for the Garden City Telegram. She delivered half of Deerfield and I delivered the other half. And it was getting cloudy and stormy and my mom came looking for me and took me home. Had to go down in the cellar, which we hated. My mom, however, is the tornado watcher and you can never keep her in the cellar. They didn't sound the alarms timely. My brother Verl was at the ballparks and they could actually see the tornado before the alarms went off. So everybody just dispersed in this mass exodus. It was a little bit wild there for a while. There was a uh, place over off, off of Kansas. Fred Sullivan had a deal there with uh, snooker tables, pool tables. That's where we, a lot of us hung out. The place was called the Plaza Q. And at the time, I had a 57 Chevy. It was a six banger with a three speed on the column. And I just had it repainted. The street there, they had just oiled and sanded. But I was parked in front of that. And there was four other guys. Well, Benny Hushka would have been one. And we decided to go to the drive-in movie. So as usual, you know, two guys got in the front and three got in the trunk. Uh, the day before I had my first job and I was working at the uh, local drive-in movie theater. And so I called uh, my manager and asked if I needed to come in that night. And he said, no, it was supposed to rain. So I didn't need to come in. We knew there was a thunderstorm out there and all that, but we're talking and it isn't time for the movie yet, but the clouds started really building. We're like, well, maybe we ought to get out of here. And about that time, probably a 20 foot by 20 foot section of the screen blew out right at us. Now we know we'd better get out of here. So we take out to the exit. A bunch of other people are going back through the entrance to get their money back. So we drive over to where the, we'd park the cars, all the others, and the north side of my car was sandblasted clean from all that sand on the street. You couldn't tell what color it was. I was at home and um, I was just in the kitchen baking some banana bread and had bare feet on and I wasn't paying much attention to what the weather was doing. My parents were outside. All of a sudden they hollered to, that there was a tornado coming and to get in the basement. So we ran down in the basement and uh, heard the tornado passing over us. And it really is just like what they say a tornado sounds like. It sounds like you're standing right by a train track. And I think it was the Martin Hushka family that lived over on Janice Lane or Melanie Lane. And they had just built a house in town and it tore a lot of their brick house. Benny's folks had bought a house in town about four blocks north of that. We drive over there and actually drive by the house because the roof had been taken off. So we go in and uh, his folks were fine. They had a basement, but windows blown out. And of course it rained and stuff. We were living in town on A Street and um, we had a window air conditioner on the back of the house. And mom had a piece of metal that would did for, it would make the rain run off of the air conditioner. And we heard that piece of metal be torn away from the house. And so we looked out the front window and we had three trees in the front yard at that time. And we just saw this one tree just go over. 
we just saw the root ball of the tree. Well, my brother had been down playing softball and the sirens had sounded. So he got in his car, came home. So here he comes running around the house and then we couldn't get the front door open to get him in the house. Um, the pressure was just so much. And so we were all pulling and he was pushing. So mom went to the back of the house and opened a window about this far and it allowed the pressure to suck that door open and everybody says it sounds like a train. I don't know whether it sounded like a train, but the suction in the house was so great. I mean, the house just felt like it was just gonna explode. We had a horse over at Lakin. We were getting her bread to raise a colt and we came through Holcomb with pulling that horse trailer, bringing her back and just kind of lifted us off the ground and set us over to the side, didn't tear anything up. We just went on right on down the road and that scared me half to death, I remember that. I'd never seen anything like that. I remember looking at it and thinking I probably should go to the basement. That's what a smart person would do. Instead, I stood out here and looked at it, <laughs> you know, but you, you were so fascinated with it. We headed back upstairs when we thought the tornado was through, but then um, another tornado came. There was a second one that wasn't as strong as, as the first one. And so after it was over, we headed upstairs and my father was the first one up. He came back to the door and he hollered that, uh, he said, mom's house is gone. We were running over there and her house was completely gone. It was clear strung across the, the field to the, to the east and, and uh, everything was just destroyed. And so she was still alive. We found her down in the basement. My father somehow found a way to, to get one of our cars, which the windows were smashed and everything. And he found a way to get to the highway to find some help somehow. And eventually a uh, ambulance was able to get through all the power lines and such and take my my uh, grandmother and my parents went to the hospital. My parents came home later in the evening and said my grandmother had passed away. And then it blew over what seemed like very quickly. And we didn't lose any windows in our house, but it did pull all the power off the back of the house. We were living up on Wheat Ridge, north part of Garden City, and I was working uh, for the packing plant, the new producer's packing company. We had uh, Walt Hackney was the manager of the plant and he was called up to a meeting in Iowa. And so I, I went with him. We left late after work and so we was about after midnight. Turned in a hotel up there in Iowa somewhere and this guy asked us where we were from. We said Garden City, Kansas. And he said, well, a tornado just went through Garden City, Kansas. My folks lived on North Main up there by the, we called it the new house high school, but now it's an old one. The only damage Dad had was the corner of the house. The roof had pretty wide overhang, and it knocked a corner down because of branch that hit it. Where Lewis Motors is, and that other, was it Regency? That street there, you know, it's called Lover's Lane. Used to be lined with huge cottonwood trees on both sides of that lane. And uh, it tore those trees up quite a bit. We got on the phones in the motel and the phones were all down down here. But at the time, the packing plant had uh, still had some cattle buyers on board and they all had those early bag phones. So we went back out in the car and Walt called Bill Lewis, who was down here at the cattle buyer. And I can remember, I sat in the back seat, Walt sat there with the phone. Yeah, my roof's gone, Harley's roof's okay. <laughs> and then he went on and described what happened. And Walt says, well, he says, we can't do much down there. We'll go on to, up to the meeting and then come back in about, about a couple days. Well, I felt a lot better when I knew the roof was on the house. <laughs> then me, I'd have turned around and come back. Our oldest daughter, and I were on the way home from Wichita and it got stormy. And between Dodge and Garden, we just felt like we were gonna blow off the road. It was so gusty. And it started storming and raining and, and uh, the radio went blank. We couldn't even get anything on the radio. And uh, 
Then as we got into the garden, it was almost dark then. They stopped us. We couldn't walk into our house. About a block uh, on, down on 3rd, they stopped us and we had to walk in. And we were scared to death, of course, because we saw roofs off and we were sure relieved when it got around the corner and ours was still on. And then, of course, the children, the rest of the kids, two teenagers and a smaller daughter, were there. And uh, the neighbor lady had come out and made, them, made the little ones go in to her basement. And our teenage daughter, Jane, she wouldn't leave. She had a date, and <laughs> she thought he was going to get there until she saw her uh, pick up her car, whichever car. car uh, picked up and rolled across the street on the other side of the street on a retaining wall. And then she just kind of went berserk and went on over there. I know Briar Hill was where the, the biggest damage was to residential and you didn't have the cell phones to check on what's coming or anything like that. You relied on the radio in your car and we didn't have, we we're getting ready to watch the movie so we didn't have anything on. We didn't listen to the radio that much that, at, at that point in life. You know, you, it, it wasn't like you carried it around in your pocket all the time, you know, now. Weiss folks lived up, uh, it would have been a little farther north, north of the drainage ditch. Her folks had a camper sitting in the driveway. Camper disappeared. They never did find it, but there was no damage to their house. If you look at, at pictures of the storm damage, that's kind of the way it was. It was like, you know, some places are just fine and other places aren't. The Briar Hill neighborhood is, at that point, was about the most northeast section of Garden. It was newer homes. Um, it's on the only hill in Garden City, I think. Just about two blocks south of the cemetery just off of Mary and Third Street. And most of them were built in the, the early to mid 60s, a lot of concrete block houses and stuff up there. And they really took a hit. Um, tore a lot of them you know, completely. A lot of them walls fell. I, one lady, I believe she and her kids were in their car in the garage. They'd pulled back in and the, the part of the garage fell on their car. It, it made quite a swath through town just kind of skipped over streets and stuff. And Hackney's uh, had a beam or, or something come down in their house, and it was wet well, a block and a half from us, wasn't it? Uh, right in the kids' bedroom where they would have been. If they'd have been home, the kids could have, could have been hurt. It tore up buildings down along Kansas Avenue, um, out where Cruz Liquor was, and I don't remember what was there. Then Mel Krebs Construction was out there. I think, and some other, but it, it did some damage there in the Flamingo Hotel. It tore the roof off a part of it, but then it kind of skipped through and headed farther north. It really tore the trees up at the cemetery. Um, a lot of the big old trees out there never did come out of it. We went up to the cemetery because they told everybody that the cemetery had gotten hit so bad. And um, so we went up to see if my dad's grave was okay and it was, but they said that there were actually three tornadoes that touched down, and you could see where they went through the cemetery, and every one of them, it was like they'd drawn a stripe right through the cemetery, and there were three rows that had been completely decimated. There was some damage at Deerfield. I know it hit the little gas plant that was on the west edge of town and did some damage to that, but I think mainly in Deerfield it was just trees, wind, my brother was working for a farmer whose um, home place was out by Lake McKinney and John was down in their um, basement and that he, he was going from basement window to basement window looking out because you could see the tornadoes coming. We didn't have much damage as far as that part's concerned. It just, it just went around that hill where Mary Street or where uh, Spruce goes up on the hill. They just went around that hill and cut right in the center on both sides, I mean, and took the high lines out going down to the Highway 50 and tore up a lot of stuff going to 156 to the north. And the experiment station 
had more, a lot more damage than we did out there. Our church group, the youth group that got together and we brought farm trucks into town and they started cleaning up the debris. Our group selected an area, it was out at, well, I guess it'd be uh, there about Mary Street and Jenny Barker Road. We made several trips to town with a farm truck and helped people move around. On the Jenny Barker Road, kind of on the south end, on the east side, there was a house and this a woman lived in it and she went to the basement. She was smart enough to go to the basement, but the house was destroyed and she was killed. She was retired. She wasn't very old at the time, but uh, before the tornado, she gave me a, a Bible and wanted me to have the family Bible. And so her faith was important to her. And uh, she was just uh, a very quiet, reserved lady, but we knew that she was just uh, full of love for her children and grandchildren. And that house, that was an open field to the east of that house and uh, our 4-H club picked up that house out there and you know cleaned up. Now everybody kind of got with a sh program you know and tried to clean up wherever they could. You know our neighbor's combine was in our field and, and uh, we only had three trees and they were all destroyed and we had uh, a lot of a lot of damage there too. Once, once we got her yard and everything cleaned up then we uh, kind of fanned out after that and ended up on the uh, east side of Highway 56 onto some of the experiment station's property and uh, we're cleaning up some of the debris on that side. Yeah, I mean, yeah, certainly a sad loss to have a, someone out of, out of your church to lose their life in something like this. Of course, uh, the uh, weather alerts and what aren't what they are today. Mainly we just cleared up branches and and there was a lot of Mennonites up there helping too on that uh, cleanup. The Mennonite response group came in and they literally just drove around town and anywhere there were trees down, they stopped and just cut them up and they hauled everything off. They were from all over Kansas. Most of them were not local at all. They just came in with trucks and saws and people, and they were a, a godsend. And my mom was a cook at the A. Bubert Junior High. The city got a hold of her and asked her if she would go up and make meals. So she went up and made like 300 and some sandwiches for people so they could come in because there wasn't any power so it had to be sandwiches and chips. We did that for three days. Mom went up for three days and fixed meals. People just absolutely gathered together. People would bring in food and give her help and I mean, it was astounding, and it was completely voluntary. It was uh, just one of those events when everybody pitched in and did what they needed to do, whether it's a flood or a tornado or snowstorm or whatever. Everybody just pitched in and brought the trucks or whatever to town. And uh, of course, uh, some of those farm boys were kind of amused uh, a little bit with some of the city kids that were there. They thought that picking up all that debris and all the dirt and dust and was just horrendous, but for the farm boys, it was just a fun, fun time to get together and work and help somebody out. The power plant uh, was so good to us because they restored our power quickly because they knew that we'd have people coming in and uh, Sears was so nice. There was no electricity there, but they opened up their store so we could uh, go get clothes to work to the funeral. It instills a sense of community in you that you know, I wish wouldn't fade. It's easy to forget those times, but it would be nice if it just would never fade away because that was an intense community pride that um, people knew people needed to help and they were just there. They just did it without thought. I mean, it was a much smaller community, but I still have that same sense from Garden City now. I think that's one thing about western Kansas, at least. Seems like when you get into trouble, there's people who help you out of it. I guess we've never lived in a place long enough to know it any different. So maybe we take it for granted too much.